Hey friends, I'm Otis Gibbs, and this is Brennan Lee. She's going to talk about her friendship with Guy Clark. I was introduced to Guy Clark by Noel McKay in about 2008. And Noel and Guy had known each other since the 90s, um, when he discovered Noel's band, the McKay Brothers. When I moved to Nashville, I would go over to Guy's a lot with Noel and uh, hang out with him, watch, watch him smoke and eat food and he smoked a lot of cigarettes, rolled his own cigarettes when I knew him. My first impression of Guy was that, so I'm I'm 5'10", and I have long, long hands and everything, and he shook my hand, and I was like, wow, his hand, like, dwarfs my hand. It was this big, kind of intimidating, handsome guy. Just had this energy about him that was very confident. Um, but he was loving, and he was inquisitive. And he treated me as an equal, which a man of his generation, you know, that's not always the case for someone like me. So he was special. Guy, you know, and when I said he was inquisitive, I guess part of that was he would always ask, what, what, what you got anything new? And um, I would listen. He'd, he'd listen to new songs. He would say, well, you know, let's hear that. Let's hear, let's hear it, you know, and he'd hand you a guitar that he had made. And uh, sometimes I'd play a song and he'd say, he'd go, there's something like that's, that he'd say, that's great, you know, and he'd really, really gush about it. And then sometimes he'd say, what else you got? <laughs> so he was, you know, I, and I like that. He's just very honest, but kind. He made nylon string guitars. Um, and he had some were more special than others. Like he had, they had numbers. They didn't have names. I, he had like number ten was special. This, this, this will sound weird. It's not exactly the right adjective to describe a guitar, but it was gifted. <laughs> like there was something kind of soulful about the instruments that he made. They were like him. I think he was proud of them. He always wanted you to try them out. Try this one. What do you think of this one? Oddly, I never wrote with Guy. Uh, I had the chance. I probably was shy about it, even though I knew him pretty well. I just liked, I kind of just liked sitting there with him. Yeah, I knew, I knew Susanna a little bit. And she had, um, uh, let's see if I could recall, in the kitchen was the painting that was the cover of Old Number One, right, right by the dining room table. And in the bathroom was a painting of a toilet paper roll. And I think Susanna did that one. Now, Guy was a gifted painter, too. So some, some of the paintings in the house were Guy's. But those are the two that stick out in my mind. There was a picture of, I think, his boots near the fireplace in that house. So, yeah, their art was up. Well, I, I thought of the time that, that I discovered his music, which I'd heard his name when I moved to Texas. And I knew... He had written a bunch of songs for Jerry Jeff Walker. And I was in a record store in New Orleans years ago. And, oh, there's two Guy Clark albums there. And I picked old number one because he was so handsome on the cover. And I liked the cover of it. So I remember thinking about that, thinking about because that, that same painting was up in the kitchen. Like how I remembered buying that album and wearing it out. Because, you know, that's that's the record. It's a wonderful record. Um, sure, I saw Guy get cranky, but it was more admirable in the cases that I saw because I knew Guy in the last ten years of his life, and so he'd mellowed. Um, but I saw he could—he didn't say anything, you know. If he was had an issue with a sound guy or something at a at a show, it was just his demeanor. I think that scared people sometimes. It wasn't anything he particularly said. He was just. He was very respectable. So if he gave you that look, you know, or or you kind of knew you needed to do your job. But no, I, I he was only ever sweet to me. And I knew him till the end of his life. I knew him when he was in hospice. So, yeah, it was that was tough to see because he he wanted to live. But he was in a lot of pain. He had knee pain and he had sinus issues and he is he was a cancer survivor. Um, and everything that goes along with that. 
yeah, we weren't ready for him to go. I feel like we talked a lot about what was going on currently, who was playing and what songs were happening. And that that's one thing that kept him kind of young, I think, is he was always discovering new things. And you, you know this, but Guy supported young writers. And he was always thinking about other writers and what they were up to. And, you know, he did a lot for me, um, introduced me to everyone he could. If I had a show, like Noel McKay and I would have a show, and um, I knew Guy through Noel. Guy, a guy would spend a bunch of time on the phone inviting people. Yeah. He'd invite his, his people from his label and people from his publisher, and he'd invite his friends. He'd invite Emil Harris. He'd invite... Rodney Crowell, you know, so that that was something for for me, for us. Guy used to come to the station in and see us play, and he had his, his own special table, you know, that they would set up for him, his own parking spot. So Ann, Ann Sawyer's was the the boss and the booker at the station at that time, and I remember she would make sure Guy had his parking spot, his table. She rang the bell for me the first time I ever played there. She did. And it was like one of the best damn things ever happened. Isn't it great to have that bell <laughs> rung for you? She was special. I, 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 you know, wish she was still around. I think I saw him. I think I saw him before I knew him at the uh, Union Ballroom at the at University of Texas in Austin. And then I, I, I saw him at Green Hall. And I saw him open for him at Poor David's in Dallas and I think Conroe, Texas, and Houston maybe, um, Guy and Verlin. When he played Green Hall, was the crowd respectful? No. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> it's Green Hall. <laughs> but, you know, of course, he, he. there was something in the air I noticed. He was a star. You know, and he didn't have that status his entire career. It took him till he was getting up in years to be perceived that way, I think. People didn't quite see the legend that he was uh, in his younger days. And so I could feel it at some of those shows. People were rabid fans for Guy. Like, you know, you had to beat him off with a stick. I saw a lot of that. People got went gaga, just lost their wits around him. It took me a while to get out of that where I felt nervous around him. And then I, it, it, I went over the hump and I, you know, he's just a guy. I think guy, I mean, just on a personal sort of level, he did like to be recognized for his, his skill. And obviously I recognized his skill, but he also appreciated as we all do being treated like a human. And so we had some vernacular in common. And I'd spent a lot of time in Texas and um, he was just, he was folks too, you know, and we were too. So just, just hanging with folks. That's nice. How did, how did you hear about his passing? I think someone, it must've been Tamara. Some of his real close friends had a special thing out in, I think West Texas, Terry Allen and some of those folks took his ashes out there, but there was a wake for Guy um, at Jim McGuire's place. I think that's his name. Photographer, yes. Yeah, there was a wake for a guy. We played some songs. That was intense, emotional. It was very informal, but I think we, I think I played a song or two. Um, if I sing a guy tune, it's usually like a nickel for the fiddler or, um, Sis Draper or, uh, she ain't going nowhere. But I think Rodney might have might have sung that one that night. I love the cape. I love stuff that works. I love everything on old number one. I love instant coffee blues. I think it's a masterpiece. 